It's so great to be here. We got Benjamin right here, my pal, and Alfred. And Matt in the back. I, I leaned over to, to Pastor Kevin and I, when he said that to me and I said, man, Garrett as Elf, <laughs> he's gonna be the next pastor of kingdom. <laughs> songs I've selected this morning, I just want us to keep in mind the whole process of what it took, the making room, if you will, of Mary and Joseph, the, the process of trusting in the way, the plan of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven coming and how it's such the opposite right of the ways of this world a new order emancipating freeing us mm -hmm. Build my house upon a stone A stone so rarely built upon I feel quite foolish and naive crazy but it's true it started out confusing too and just gets stranger by the day but that's okay I've been the blind man on the road I've been the boy running back
Thank you, Jesus, for coming. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. For bringing a completely radical, revolutionizing kingdom. A kingdom holy, other than, completely different. to the newborn king sing us with his glory to glory to the newborn king dead on
I just want to say this. I believe in the kingdom of Jesus. And so I wrote this song uh, as a statement of the kingdom of Jesus against all other other kingdoms, right? Uh, I wrote this. I started declaring this in my prayer room about 25 years ago. And I kind of laid the song down for a long time because because I feel like as Christians so many times when it comes to politics we're all taking sides instead, instead of being transcendent people following our King Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. But we're the kingdom people. I brought it back. I'm going to recut this, I think, on a record soon because I just feel like declaring it again. It just says, Back in the Bible, there was that old Pharaoh who ruled over Egypt and Israel. And God spoke to Moses through fire to bushes. Kick off your shoes and stay all of humanity was made to worship Pharaoh, get out of my way Gotta say freedom Freedom to dance Freedom Freedom to sing Freedom Freedom to grow I'm telling you Supposedly, Pharaoh is all over town and in churches of bad. Powerful weaklings who practice their politics, stealing from Jesus his beautiful bride. Where the old Pharisees said, You see, heresies, you best get out of God's way. God is saying,
Oh, little town of Bethlehem. There's a new king coming. There's a new way coming. A new deliverance coming. So I literally finished this song. I started writing this with Nate Moore a week or so ago, and I had this idea about like that mountain. I got a mountain up ahead, or the when the mountain seems so tall in the midst of suffering, when we've lost the words to sing Gloria. And thinking about this Christmas season, even the mountain that Mary had to climb, right? The journey that Joseph and Mary had to take, the journey to make room for the savior of the world, right? To break through all the shame. And I, I, I've, I've had this on my heart for, for years, this idea of, what about, what about the mountains that God puts in our way that were actually never meant to be moved. They were meant to be climbed. Like actually in the climbing, God brings a bit of freedom too. In the climbing, God shows us something new. In the climbing, we grow in our relationship with him in a completely new way. And so I had this idea, I was like, I'm climbing a mountain. Like my face could not move. You ever had those in your life? And, you, and, and Jesus says, come on, let's go on a journey. And you just keep saying, man, it'd be nice if we could just move every mountain. But sometimes the mountains are actually placed there by God and you're trying to move it in vain and it won't move. And Jesus says, come on, take my hand. Let's walk this mountain. And uh, so I thought, well, let's write a song about that. I'm climbing a mountain. Oh, and then the bridge when we're singing it. He was so funny. I, I don't know that it necessarily applies, but 
But we were flying in yesterday. It was a, it was a, I fly a lot, but it was a terrifying flight coming in yesterday. And uh, you know it's going to be kind of terrible when the pilots are like, man, this, they're talking in the you know, cockpit that it's going to be a little bit of a rough landing. And uh, the lady sitting next to me, she kept, she, she, we started hitting this turbulence, and you know, you're doing this thing, and I fly a lot, so turbulence doesn't usually bother me, but it was a bit much. And, uh, and, and, and we're coming in, and she starts calling out to Jesus, but I just realized in her calling out to Jesus that she was, it was like, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, and she was right next to me and doing that oh Jesus thing, which kind of has the essence of to whom it may concern. Do you know what I mean? It's a, I, the more she said it, the more I knew, I knew that her Jesus and my Jesus may not be the same Jesus because the more she said his name, the more anxiety I had. And I almost wanted to say, can you please stop saying Jesus that way? But anyway, I just, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to. So I started, I, that second verse, I was like, so it could be anything, really, right? But it could be Mary. It could be carrying Jesus. It could be the way that God brought about salvation history, which, thanks to Pastor Kevin giving me the passage to preach on this morning, we're going to talk about that. Um, this is meaning, I love it when he, when he has me preach on a passage, because I said, oh, man, you're giving me work to do. I can't just, you know preach one of my good messages. I actually have to <laughs> work for this. <laughs> I have to learn something new, Kev. Anyway, uh, but I started thinking about that. So I will not fear. So I will not fear that second verse, what I do not know. Would I misunderstand? How about this one? What I can't control. Ooh. When I'm saying that, I don't want to be sounding, I wanted you to know this. I'm not saying it like, I don't fear what I misunderstand, what I don't know, and what I can't control. I fear it just like you fear it. But we need to let go of that, right? And, God, and let God's kingdom come. Whenever Jesus comes with presence, it's always the end of our way and the beginning of God's way. And uh, so... Anyway, I wrote this song. So. This is, I'm climbing a mountain. My faith could not move. It's the only way forward. It's the only way through. No bridges or highways. Directions or plans These pathways of presence Remind me again Will you sing that with me? Climbing I'm climbing a mountain My faith could not move It's the only way forward it's the only way through No bridges or highways Directions or plans These pathways of presence Remind me again That I've got a father knows me by name and I've got a shepherd who won't lead me astray I've got a future I've got a hope I've got a promise I'm never alone. Say that once again. I've got a father who knows me by name. I've got a 
is a journey through the highs and the lows there's no need to hurry let's take it slow the time we've been given is a treasure we hold The older I'm getting, this one thing I know I've got a father who knows me by name, I've got a shepherd. got a future I've got a hope I've got a promise I'm never alone goodness and mercy I follow Let's do that bridge one more time. Goodness and mercy. Oh, the goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life. They're following me in my dwelling will be the house of the Lord forever. Let's sing it again. Your goodness and mercy, Lord. Your goodness and mercy are following of 
So I will not fear what I do not know, what I misunderstand or cannot control. My dwelling will be the house of the Lord forever. I've got a father. I've got a father who knows me by name, who knows me by name. I've got a shepherd. I've got a shepherd who won't lead me astray. I've got a future. I've got a future. I've got a hope. I've got a promise. I'm never. Amen. You can be seated. Turn in your Bibles to uh, Luke 1, 46 to, 40 to 55, we're going to read. Verse 46, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abram and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Pastor Kevin asked me to preach on this this morning. And one of the things as I read it. And I began to study. One of the things that became. Very apparent, you just look it up is how revolutionary how offensive historically you just do your own research on it this song of mary is it's literally rumored to be feared by some empires in the world and at times throughout history, the recitation of this song of Mary has actually been banned. Sometimes it's kind of hard. You know, I say rumors, right? <laughs> rumors have it because sometimes, you know, when you're dealing with empires, <laughs> sometimes they 
you know, they don't look so fondly on, you know, bad news getting out about them. You know what I mean? Can be a little hard to prove due to, you know, totalitarian regimes stranglehold on the facts of history. <laughs> but indeed, in India and Guatemala and Argentina, there were times in history you couldn't even recite this because it was speaking to the powers, prophesying about the way of Jesus and the way of the kingdom. Dietrich Bonhoeffer actually said this of Mary's song. He, he said, it's the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary hymns ever sung. What's so revolutionary about it? The song is an anthem if you will, of the biblical narrative. As well as actually a coming to pass of what the prophets foretold, that every valley will be exalted and every mountain will be made low. And those who control the mountains of society, of culture, of the world, even Christians who control the mountains, the society, the cultures of this world, they fear the way of the Lord. Verse 48, for God has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. One of the things that I first picked up on is, is, is this is how there's this that he gives those that are hungry good food. Right? God doesn't seem to be looking for perfection to bring about his purposes, but for hearts. Hearts that are truly his, where his kingdom can actually reign. Transcend all the other kingdoms that many of us, including myself, have allegiances to. Can I have your heart, Jason? And God in this song of Mary doesn't seem to relate to humanity on the basis of being right or wrong, but on the basis of the humble and the proud, the hungry and the full. I love how he says, to those that are hungry, I will give good food. Yeah. Have you ever been around full people? <laughs> I mean, spiritually, I mean that metaphorically, right? They're just full. You could share with them that you raised somebody from the dead and they've been like, yeah, I've seen that before. You, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like that kind of full. Like I remember an old, well, Father Gillick always says this. He says, you know somebody's humble when they can still be surprised. That's a, something about that. But there's something that the Magnificat, which is Latin for magnify, there's something it's magnifying. It's magnifying. You know, when you read it, you can immediately see the history of what's happened, what's being declared as an anthem in Mary's song. She's declaring the prophet. She's declaring what's been foretold. She's been, and she's also declaring and magnifying something that we've seen before within Biblical history. The first one I think of when I was reading this is Hagar. When you when you read the song of Mary, I, I don't I think it's almost impossible to not think of Hagar, the similarities, right? God has been mindful of me. Before we get to Hagar, let me just say this. That idea of being mindful of the humble state of the servant. I love this. How could we say it? We could say that God has looked at 
gazed upon, concentrated on, paid attention to. How about this? Magnified the overlooked. Illuminated the unseen. Maybe the shameful, maybe our dark side, maybe extended mercy through our dark side, through our shame, extended mercy through what we were trying to hide, right? Not in spite of it. God has been mindful. I remember one of the first times I came to Westover, we were going over the Westover Bridge and viewing Morgantown and the university there and, and the lights. And I couldn't stop thinking about Bethlehem. I couldn't stop thinking about Nazareth or Cedarburg, Wisconsin, where I'm from. Where Rachel and I have lived and grown our family. Of all the big happenings that happen in all these overlooked places. And all these unknown people of our lives. And I remember I, I told Kevin this week, I, I remember every time I come to town, I, always, I, always, I was with Micah in the hotel, and I kept getting this melody. Here we are in Morgantown. I could have said Bethlehem town. I could have said Cedarburg, Morgantown. You know, I could have said Westover. I don't know why. Here we are in Morgantown. Jesus lives in Morgantown. Here we are in Morgantown. Just waiting on the coming day. Every time I come to Morgantown, I sing, Here we are in Morgantown. Jesus lives in Morgantown. Here we are in Morgantown. Waiting on the coming day. It reminds me of something that John O'Donohue, he says, he says that some of our most wonderful memories are beautiful places where we felt immediately at home. I love the word beauty because beauty has that In the Greek, the word for beauty actually is, is sort of related to the word call. And we have a lot of these in, in history. And so does that make sense, y'all? Hagar. Pregnant. Let's call it what it was, right? A slave girl on the run from Abraham's household. She's found by God on the run. And she's asked this question, where have you come from and where are you going? It's actually a great question for many of us who feel inadequate or unseen or unknown and therefore are constantly on the run trying to find the place that will make us feel seen. As if the who we are changes with the where we are. But it doesn't. It's the who we are that changes the way we see the where we are and the way we see the people 
of the where we are for who they are. Ah, that's a tongue twister poet, isn't it? <laughs> the way I said that, so I'll say it again. See, it, it, it's, it's a great word. Where are, wherever you come from and where you're going, it's, it's good for us to hear that question because of the inadequacy of our unseen, unknown space. And therefore, we're constantly on the run trying to find the place that will make us feel seen as if the who we are changes with the where we are. But it doesn't, doesn't work that way. It's the who we are that changes the way we see the where we are and the way we see the people of the where we are for who they are. And Hagar's encounter goes both ways with vision. It's so vivid that she actually is used by God via scripture to define God in a totally new way as a God who sees. But in Genesis 16, 3, we also see this girl on the run, right? Found by God, encountering God in a way that now God wants to utilize to declare something about his character and who God actually is. I want you to reveal for everyone for the first time, I'm the God who sees right where you are. But also a very powerful thing happens. She sees God. That's, that was troubling. That was revolutionary in that time. And she didn't die? Verse 16, 3, listen to this. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. I've got a father who knows me by name. I've got a shepherd who won't lead me astray. I've got a future. I've got a hope. I've got a promise, I'm never alone. There's a God who sees, there's a God who sees, there's a God who sees right where we are. His love is strong, it won't let go. He holds us with his sacred heart. And even when we're far from home, there's a God who sees right where we are. Those songs couldn't even have been sung had it not been for a revolutionary moment with a pregnant slave girl on the run that God finds and reveals himself in a way and then she begins to articulate that. Hagar found. For the purposes of making all things new to transform the world. How about Leah? When I read Mary, I can't help but think of Leah. When I think of the overlooked places, right? Jacob. Nobody runs more than Jacob. Nobody works it more than Jacob. And then Jacob gets worked. What's powerful about it is Jacob gets deceived into being an ancestor of Jesus. That's that's powerful. Because he wants Rachel. He doesn't want the unnoticed one. He doesn't want the less fair one. But somebody else has a future. Somebody else has a hope. Somebody else has a promise. Somebody else isn't unknown, unloved. Somebody else is being seen by God, not just Rachel. But the unseen one, the overlooked, the unloved by Jacob, is found by God. Genesis 
29:31 says, "And when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren." And ultimately, Jesus, the Savior of the world, would come from Leah's offspring, Judah. That's powerful, isn't it? Then, of course, there's Moses. The one chosen to deliver Israel from the bondage of slavery, hidden in a basket, floating down a stream. Found. Then, of course, there's David. Jesse's son, very likely considered illegitimate. Right from the Psalms, we read that he was born in sin. Samuel has to beg even the mention of his name from Jesse after being introduced to all of his other sons. I'm paraphrasing. After introducing all of the other sons that were favored in Jesse's eyes, right? Samuel basically says, Jesse, there's, there must be another son. Jesse, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, almost blushing. Is that fair to say? Almost blushing, right? From whatever reason, we're not fully sure. David hints at the illegitimacy, but we're not fully sure. But almost blushing, he gives it up to Samuel. Oh, yeah, you mean, you mean the boy out in the field. The shepherd boy. who God would make king. And of course, it's Jesus. The center of this magnificat, this center of this magnification, right? This the center is literally overlooked by Nathaniel in John 1, 5, 1. For the same reason all the other people we've mentioned have been overlooked. He must not be any. Because he comes from the wrong town. Nathaniel can't see. He's lost the ability to be mindful, a looker, a seer. His inability to see is actually related, we find through that passage. It's related to his need to be found. And once he's found, he actually begins to see. Isn't that something? What good could come out of Nazareth, Nathaniel says. And Jesus doesn't respond to Nathaniel's lack of ability of seeing his blindness with blindness. But he actually responds to Nathaniel with, you can't see me, but I saw you under the fig tree. I can see you. I saw you daydreaming of beauty, of calling of destiny under the fig tree. I see you. And once, once you begin to realize these, you know, once you begin to realize your own annunciation moment, right? And that this moment has nothing to do with where you are, but who you are, your eyes will be opened and you will be able to see the savior of the world is rising out of the little overlooked place you say nothing good can come from. Jesus offered Nathaniel an annunciation moment. He offered Nathaniel, and what happens? You are the Lord. I can see. 
an emancipation moment, a freedom moment. And each of us have had many of these in, in our own lives. I, I've been reading a book through COVID. Oh, I've probably read, read it three or four times by David Brooks. Amazing book called The Second Mountain. And he says, he says, one of, one of the trickiest parts of an enunciation moment is not actually having it, but realizing that you're having it. He, he tells this story about Albert Einstein. Doesn't everybody love a story about Albert Einstein? I don't have to throw this in, but I thought, this is amazing. One day when Albert Einstein was four or five, um, he, was, he had to stay home sick. And so his father bought him a, brought him over a compass. Has anybody heard this story? And the sight of it, with the magnetic needle swinging about under the influence of a hidden force field. He's four or five, guys. It made him tremble. He became obsessed with hidden forces. Magnetic fields, gravity, inertia, acceleration. Einstein later said, I can still remember it that this experience made a deep and lasting impression on me. Something deeply hidden had to be behind things, he later wrote. It was an enunciation moment, and these enunciation moments have already happened in your life and in my life, but the trickiest part about them is we hardly ever know when they're happening. I remember my enunciation moment was, uh, it was uh, Robert Stamps, Methodist minister, Corey Tim Boom's right-hand woman was his wife, Ellen Stamps. They were my first mentors when I was 15, 16 years old. They led me in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They led me in praying contemplatively. They led me in listening skills and listening to the Holy Spirit daily and having daily devotions and daily prayer habits. And, and he was the first person that told me I was a poet but I'd never written poetry. But somehow he saw in me a poet because of the way I thought about things, the way I saw the world. Oh, you're a poet, Jason. Hey, Tom Fitch, who was like a big brother to me, he went to Temple University in Berkeley and all that. He, he had to go back to Temple for some celebration, and, and it's a big Methodist church. <clears throat> and, and at the time, in the 90s, it was one of the only integrated churches in America that was thriving. And so they agreed that I was going to lead worship on Sunday service. Well, I'd never led worship before. So I got together with a band and we put together the songs. Back then it was like a radical thing to sing like a song like, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Lord, I, you know, and I remember... I, I sang all the songs that I could that everybody knew, hoping that I could get them to sing along with me, and it was, it was horrible. <laughs> it was possibly the worst <laughs> worship service. I'm sure it's on record somewhere. <laughs> no, nobody stood, nobody was into it, nobody clapped. Everybody sort of looked at me like I was ruining their worship service. And I remember I had this moment, you know, I had this moment where I was like, this isn't going anywhere. These songs that everybody knows, I can't even get them to sing these songs. So I just stood up and I had this one song that I had written, Joshua on his face before the Lord. I remember the second verse of it. I stood up from the piano and stopped playing it. Spirit of God, spirit of purity, spirit who knows, spirit who sees, fire from heaven, come. I mean, back then, the Methodist churches had that fire on the, you know, <laughs> fire from heaven come. You'd think that they'd want the fire from heaven to come, but they didn't look like they wanted the fire from heaven to come. And I'm looking at fire from heaven come, redeeming presence come. And then I start pointing at the people from the grand piano. You and I'm just this kid. You and I, we've heard the tempter's plea, and I start speak singing. 
You and I, we've heard the tempter's plea that sin will only hurt if someone sees. So we fight the fight to win, forgetting once again there is no victory without hearts of purity. And then without even trying, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a, a, a age-old wise musician trick. I just didn't have anything else to say. So I just left the whole thing silent and it was over, the worship service. With that, and I went and sat down. <laughs> there was a lot of tension. <laughs> and I felt it. And I'm sure that he heard it. As a pastor of a church of 2,000 people, and the kid that he has lead worship ruins the whole worship service, he heard it. He was going to hear about it on Monday morning. Why'd you have that kid ruin my worship service? I felt like the little kid in um, Home Alone when the, when the uncle's like, you little twerp, you ruined our Christmas. This is the way I felt as I was sitting in that crowd. And I remember, I remember in the Methodist church, they, would, they had three doors in those old churches, right? And, they, in, and the balcony. And, and I, I, had, I was determined I was going to get to that door because most, most people were going up the middle to be greeted and probably complain to Pastor Bob on their way out and he greeted everybody on their way out in his robes and I'm walking this way and all of a sudden I hear his big old Irish voice young Jason as I'm trying to escape <laughs> young Jason come here and he made me walk through the whole crowd of people that looked like the uncle and home alone now, I didn't do that, but I felt that. Oh, God, I'm sorry I didn't ruin your worship service. I'm sorry. But I didn't say that. I just had that kind of didn't. I wanted to get out of there and never do that again. And I walk up to him through the crowd, and he waits for me and makes the people now wait, the same people that I just ruined their worship service. And he says so boldly, he grabs me, he kisses me on the cheek, and he says, young Jason, you're such a poet. Man, I love the original. That's what he said to me. I love the original. I think he said number. You know how the old people did it? I love the original number. You know you're going to have to do it again. Because <laughs> I've got a father who knows me by name and I've got a shepherd who won't lead me astray and I've got a future I've got a hope somehow he saw the future of the little poet child he saw the calling he saw the beauty he saw it before I could even see it when I was trying to run away from it he found me in the midst of the running and said, I see you. <laughs> Lastly, and I think this applies um, because there's different ways that we can live. We can try to be in the right place or we can try to become the right people and be declarers and seers of the place we are and the people who live here in Westover and Morgantown and Cedarburg. We can be all those unknown people to others. We can be people who bring moments of enunciation and calling and value and worth and declaration but we're going to have to choose what way we're going to follow. And Christmas time is a good time to do it. Eugene Peterson, he says, the leading leaders of the beginning of the Christian era were Jesus and Herod. It's interesting to observe what has happened in the 2,000 years sense. Jesus is the name that continues to be recognized and honored. But Herod, 
whose name is obscure and of interest only to historians, is more often than not the way being followed. Jesus and Herod died in approximately the same year. The birthplace of Jesus, a cave for the keeping of domestic animals in the time of Jesus. And the burial site of Herod, a mammoth Herodian temple mount that he made himself so that he wouldn't be forgotten because his family hated him so much. He knew everyone wanted him to be forgotten. So he built and built and built and built and built something that would force him to be remembered. Edifices of himself everywhere, all being established because he was dying the same year Jesus, the savior of the world, the king, the real king was coming. These two places, Eugene says, are visible to each other. I think that's important. There, there's two ways that are visible for us. The Herod way, the Jesus way. And one way is actually revolutionary. It's actually found in this Mary's song. You have been mindful to those that are hungry. To the overlooked. And like Herod, many of us will just keep building and building and building and building and missing the who we are and the who you are and the beauty of where we are. For that if I could just get there, or I could just build this, or I could just do this, then I would be something. When in reality, throughout Scripture, God hardly ever utilizes the proud, the haughty, the powerful. I mean, look at just the history in this nation of revival and where it's come. It's always in some backwoods area, some crazy place. I mean... really difficult to get to. Don't you? I just love that. And we have a Bethlehem town here. Phillips Brooks. Your uncle. No, just kidding. 1835 to 1893. He's a little old. <laughs> oh, little town of Bethlehem. I mean, look at what we have out here today. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by, yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above while mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wondering love. O morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to all on earth. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin where meek souls will receive him still. Where meek souls will receive him still. Where meek souls will receive him still. The dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. I found online there was this verse that ended up being so controversial. It was omitted, but... Oh, man, I like controversy. So I, I thought, man, I got to read this one. 
Where children pure and happy pray to the blessed child. Where misery cries out to thee, son of the undefiled. That was the controversial word phrase. It's amazing what we've made a controversy in Christianity through the years. That line. Uh, where children pure and happy pray to the blessed child, where misery cries out to the son of the undefiled, where charity stands watching and faith holds wide the door, the dark night wakes, the glory breaks, and Christmas comes once more. I'm climbing a mountain. Stand with me and sing this together. My faith cannot move. Because it's the only way forward. It's the only way through. No bridges or highways. Directions or plans. Pathways of presence remind me again. Who knows me by name? And I've got a shepherd who won't lead me astray. I've got a future and I've got a hope I've got a promise I'm never alone. We're going to sing this Do we want to do the basket thing or what are we, what are we doing, Kevin? I know I'm over time here, so. You want to sing it or? Yeah. Life is a journey, sing it. So let's take it to the highs and lows. No. Let's take it slow. time we've been given is a treasure we hold and the older I'm getting this one thing I know that I've got a father who knows me by name I've got a shepherd who won't lead me straight. I've got a future. I've got a hope. I've got a promise. I'm never.
Promise. 